Hey, Tommy from The Run Testers. In this video, myself, Nick and Mike are going to be talking about marathons. So many of you may have a marathon coming up soon. Many of you may be doing your first marathon. In this video, we're going to be talking about all of the advice and all of the things that we use uh, to train for marathons, whether that's shoes, whether that's tech, uh, whether that's different types of fueling that, that we use. Um, this is also part of the podcast. So if you're planning on listening to the podcast, don't watch this video because it's included in that as well. Right, let's dive in and chat about marathons. So in this video, we are going to be talking about, well, it's also a podcast if you're if you're listening to the podcast version of this, we are going to be talking about marathons. So um, in later in, or well, could in a couple of months, we're going to do, be doing a specific video on uh, a specific podcast on London Marathon. This time we're just giving advice, talking about our training and the sort of kit that we use for that training. So let's jump in. Um, I thought the best way to kick this off would be to talk about the types of of training we do and the sort of times we're aiming for in marathons so if people are listening to this they can get a good idea of who they should be listening to so mike what's your aim for london marathon uh so aim for london marathon is to definitely get around unscathed but if training goes all right and training has been fine so far um aim is to go quicker than the last one that i did were all my quickest which was 324 so if i can get below that i'll be very very happy i mean re optimistically i'd love to run like kind of around 310 315 if i'm fully fit and feel good um so that's kind of you know i'm trying not to put too much pressure on myself in terms of what i want to do but i mean ultimately that's where i'm kind of aiming around that's realistically what i think i can do and get around in that time so okay we'll see the training is uh yeah training is well in progress so <laughs> nick uh what's your aim for the for london london i'm aiming to pb so i'm looking to run uh 227 basically sub 228 which is 330 per k pace 535 uh, miles oh, no so yeah about 330 per k pace i'm okay um so that's the aim my current pb is 228 30 odd and i've never really nailed london i'd like to really nail london uh, for the first time and get around with a pb kind of paces and training at the moment are kind of easy it's like 445 to 5 i guess 430 to 5 depending how fresh i am which is not very fresh and then yeah down towards marathon paces at around pretty tempo effort i'd say so okay yeah you tom uh, so my PB last year in Berlin was two fifty three, fifteen. I think. I know that because it was, uh, I think it was thirty seconds faster than Andy's attempt in Valencia. <laughs> right. Um, so, so just based on needle, basically. I, was say, I don't really know seconds, but if you're doing it based on needle, then fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, when I did Chicago, I really cared about the time, so it was like engraved on my mind. But Berlin, I just wanted a PB, yeah. but I, I didn't really have a focus on it. Um, so. Boston, I would like a PB, uh, but I don't. It's highly unlikely, I think, because I don't think I'm gonna. I'm basically training a bit harder than I was, or I should be training a bit harder than I was for Berlin, and I've seemed to retain my speed from um, Berlin. But uh, yeah, I just don't. I, I, I'm not as bothered about this, so I think it might that might have a mental impact on how well I do. But I would like. A, I would like to get about two fifty five in 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 boston nice. you want to get your boston time in boston <laughs> exactly yeah and i want to continue to get my good for age time of course yeah mm. yeah um all right so leading on from that uh what type of mike what, what does your training look like for a marathon what is it what is like your average week for your sort of plan that you're using um so i am using i'm actually using an app that you recommended to me tom so it's the run with how one it's the one oh, i yeah. started to use uh, when I was training for London last year, and it is um, it's a free and a paid version for it. It's pretty pretty straightforward. It kind of you know you build it and based on the times when you're doing it, when you're going to do the marathon, and then it will build you a plan. You kind of it, it links with my Garmin. It actually only works with Garmin at the moment, which is slightly frustrating. If I'm testing other stuff, I'm testing the Polar. Back, I've got the Polar back on my wrist again, so not ideal. But it will kind of pull the the runs in, give you those kind of recommended runs, give you a breakdown of the type of run you're doing. And I've kind of gone, I haven't gone for the kind of, looks like kind of beginner, intermediate kind of advanced plans because of where I'm at and where, you know, I'm kind of playing catch up. I've kind of gone for a kind of intermediate plan. So it's probably not what I would usually 
kind of follow. So maybe the model is not the usual that I would have to probably do, but it means that I can, there's probably a lot of, a lot more base runs in there, a lot more, and a lot more, the longer runs become a nearer to the weekend, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So yeah, it's, 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 it can adapt based on what I put in and, you know, it works well for me. It's very easy plan to follow. As I said, because I generally will be running with a Garmin of some kind. It can pull my runs through and adapt based on the runs I'm doing. And it's, it's just a very easy app to use. I've been using the paid version. Um, I, you know, I don't have a coach, so I've always kind of relied on kind of training apps and apps in general to, and they've been five for me before. It's the first time I've used this. And yeah, it seems to be, I mean, I really liked using it last year when i was start you know the first few months with it so i've kind of stuck with it and it, it's just it's just a very easy app to follow and kind of you know follow in terms of my training are you using the paid for version because you i'm the using one. the paid for version yeah. yeah yeah because the paid for version i think gives you a little bit more in terms of the the kind of a, the, the kind of adjustable Adapting feedback and stuff yeah yeah run, yeah yeah that's what i did when i was using it yeah um all right nick you we, we know you've got a coach what does your <laughs> training look like in an average week yeah, I'm a coach, so I get it kind of week by week, my training, rather than having the whole block kind of mapped out. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing quite high mileage for me. I'm up to about kind of 115, 120K at the moment, the highest mileage I've done. Usually, it's pretty relaxed start of the week because I don't do a, the only run I can do on a Tuesday is a buggy run when I have my kid. Uh, so I just do a relaxed run there. And then Wednesday is usually a big workout. Friday is usually, it's like a, well, it's like a steady hour is what we do. It. So that's it's not quite tempo pace, but it will be at, you know, a decent uh, decent speed. And then big workout Saturday usually, or you know, big long run Sunday, or a combination of both. But yeah, so lot, quite a lot of the weekends and Wednesdays are the big hard days mm. filled in with easy running around that. Um, so it's similar to what I've done for the past, you know, the other workouts I've done, but my schedule's changed a little bit. So the mileage is higher now. I'm able to get out for a bit more. So it's... Yeah, probably a harder block than I've ever done before, actually. I think it's fair mm-hmm. to say. And I'm a more enjoyable block as well. It's good to have a bit of a challenge after a few years of doing marathons. Mm. Well, I've, you, I've, I'm doing six days a week as well. Well, I'm meant to be doing six days a week. But my my, my I've got a coach, Liz, uh, and I did, and she's the one who coached me to Berlin, um, my T5-3. So I've stuck with her for this. Um, and my yeah, I've got six days a week. Three of those days are pretty no two of those days are pretty easy one is park run one is a long run (laughs) uh and the long runs at the moment so when i did uh berlin at this point i'd have just been doing long runs but now all of my long runs have tempo elements in them so you know Mm. you do like i think one on sunday is 18 miles with three sets of four miles at nearly marathon pace or a bit slow to marathon pace um and then i've got then I, i do uh well, I'm doing track at the moment on Wednesdays, but I shouldn't really be doing track. I need to be doing longer um, sessions. Uh, but yeah, so six days uh, and it's, you know, those, those hard ones are quite tough though. I'm not looking forward to um, <laughs> the Sunday. I will say one big thing, it's always been a big thing of my coach, uh, Andy, is uh, progression runs and marathons. It's, it's, I'd usually do one of those in the week, just even as part of, you know, start easy. So it's, it's pretty much an easy run because you won't be finishing that fast, but lots of progression runs where you're finishing at a faster pace, working a bit harder by the end, which I think yeah. for me is really good mentally for simulating marathon where, you, you know, it will feel easy at the start, but gets harder okay. as you go. And so long runs, big long runs, normally be doing, yeah, easy to steady or something like that or finishing fast for a half hour at the end just to put some hard miles on tired legs. I just miss doing normal long runs. No, <laughs> there's nothing worse than you know thinking, oh god, I don't even want to do this. I buy about uh, 40 minutes in, and no, you've got to up the pace. Uh, the rest of it. <laughs> well, I did a big half and half 20 miler at the weekend, so it's first half pretty easy, second half steady. Mm. So it's 10 miles of steady is coming up. It really makes the first 10 feel very easy though, which is good. Uh, so talking about long runs, uh, fueling for your long runs so um what what how do you do you fuel when you're training uh or do you just get through through it on whatever you've eaten i fuel pretty hard i'll say um usually there's something to test actually this block i haven't had anything to test and it's coincided with a, a friend of mine a, well it's not coincided but basically i've got a friend who's a sponsored morton athlete so i've been managing to get my little hands on quite a lot of Morton. So I've been using it a lot more than because usually I'd buy some and save it for the marathon itself. But now every session I basically, yes, anything where I'm going to be hitting a hard run, that's 40 minutes plus, I will have a Morton drink beforehand. Blimey. I'm going to go hour and 30. I will, I will bring something with me and have it on the way because it's just, it's, it also just massively helps with the recovery. I find to actually be adequately fueled and then bouncing back, 
to either work or look after a kid afterwards or just know that you're going to run the day after. So yeah, I will have yes, three or three times a week probably. I'll be having Morton stuff beforehand and after, and it's or something. You know, it doesn't have to be Morton. I, will, I also use the OTE drink and uh, some old SAS bars as well, which are definitely out of date, but only makes them stronger <laughs> probably. No, uh, um, no gels then for the long runs. Uh, I will occasionally take a gel on a long run as well. That's usually Morton as well, but I tend to carry because I carry drinks on the race day. I like to remind myself what that feels like. So a lot of long runs, I'll be carrying drinks just to remind myself mm. of that feeling of having the loaded drinks on the back. Um, which is, is fine. I, I really don't mind, but it's good to practice it. So Why practice, you, a lot of practicing now already for fueling. Yeah. Why you, Mike? Yeah, I think mainly just for the longer runs, I think um, just where I'm kind of probably replicating the type of paces that I would be doing during that race. So it's, I, I find it useful to do that and I will mainly do it for the longer runs. I think the kind of the, the runs during the week where I'm not probably doing those kind of those longer distances, I'm probably not as kind of, you know focused on doing that stuff but i think i would kind of have some kind of electrolytes or you know eat when i should be eating when i generally would be before uh, and i'm thinking of racing so you know give myself enough time and then i would take gels because ultimately i will you know i want to make sure i'm pr- i'm getting used to that or you know i've done it for years but still getting used to that fact of taking the gels when i need to take the gels taking them at the right times i know has worked for me in races I'm just kind of rep- trying to replicate that. I don't do it for every session, but I think generally, I, you know, for my longer runs, that is something that I do pay a little bit more attention to do. But, you know, during the other runs, I will try and do things in and around that time to make sure, you know, that I'm going to make the most out of those runs. But I think it's particularly for those longer runs for me where I feel I need to do that and really replicate what I would be feeling or would want to feel during kind of those kind of race conditions. Mm. I better do anything. <laughs> I, may, I may have got my fueling game on like, sorted for race day but i barely ever use any fuel in but i'd say over 25k i might take a gel <laughs> it's hard efforts it. man it's it's pretty tough on the body like uh i think <laughs> I, I know and i just feel so much better running you know if i'm gonna go do a workout i've had a car drink beforehand like, the difference yeah. in feel is is ridiculous so i know it's worth mm-hmm. doing and it's you know actually yeah. it comes a point when you've also got to think a bit about calories as well <laughs> which well, is I was, do- <laughs> I was doing a lot in uh last in the summer when i was training in the summer for chicago and Berlin because it was so hot I was drinking a lot of electrolyte drinks because it's winter I've not just not thought about it so well, well, little, a- one thing I do do on the old drinks front now is um I've started using the like, multivitamin basically Barocca but you know the cheap Barocca from Tesco or something like that um and popping that in a drink in the morning and that's a that's, that's quite a nice little touch for the winter I find getting you know a bit mainly because you oh, I always have one of them in the morning <laughs> Fair enough, <laughs> yeah. years of hard and Bailey's drinking <laughs> <laughs> but yeah those um I had some of the OT ones of them, the ones that say wellness, and it's a massive psychological thing, but those feel better than the Tesco <laughs> brand ones, but they can't be right. It's just vitamins in a, in a pill, in a, ta- in a fizzy tab, but yeah. it feels like, yeah, 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 this is for serious days, I'll have these ones, and then uh, for the rest of the time, I'll be in my Tesco own brand Baroque. Well, I'm still I on the uh, meet- precision yeah. fuel and hydration. Yeah. Well, well, I'm getting the ones that are multivitamins, not electrolytes. So I only have the electrolytes oh, okay. uh, for when I'm yeah thinking about like a long run in the, and it's a bit hotter or something like that. These, these are, yeah, multivits for, for the old protect from illnesses yeah i think that's the thing for me as well yeah like the immune you know just remembering how battered your immune system gets and i think it's just easy to you know think you've had a good run and then actually you've been fine and it probably hits you probably a couple of days later or (laughs) so yeah Yeah. all right what about recovery then Uh, i don't do anything for recovery (laughs) i don't have any sort of proteins or anything i'm guessing you do nick well i did like when i'm running a lot of my marathons I've run probably on 80k a week, 80 to 100k a week, up to now. You know, I'm not, and I don't, I didn't really bother. So now, the last two weeks, I've brought out, you know, now I'm going go oh, whatever 100k a week. I've got the SAS recovery drink that I've had for a few years, and just bring it out for basically these weeks. And after the two big workouts each week or the long run each week, uh, I will have one of those. And again, it, the difference in how you feel is actually remarkable. I kind of even make me think I should have been having it after big workouts at other times as well because nearly always after a big workout, no matter what I do with electrolytes and everything like that, later in the day, I'll be slumped, have a bit of a headache, you know, stuff like that. And with this, I, yesterday I had a really hard workout. I bounced back really nicely. Um, I think it does help quite a lot. So, yeah, in terms of actual stuff to have, I used to just go purely on food, but having this straight after the workout is the other big thing because – I you yeah I get home shower get distracted need to get back to my desk do a bit of work all mess around with uh, you know 
kids games and stuff which is not messing around it's very fun but um uh, i do that and i wouldn't have stuff to, I don't know, you know by the time i'd cooked a meal it'd probably be a bit outside mm-hmm. the ideal time so yeah this drink has helped i think so what was that drink uh, so that was the SAO, SAS recovery powder. So it's not just a protein powder. It's got loads of carbohydrates, electrolytes, and stuff like that in it as well, just general support the system stuff. Okay, uh, lovely. Uh, Mike, are you, uh, <laughs> you similar to me in your recovery um, tr- skills? I'm not. I'm not. I feel like because of what happened last year, I've definitely paid more attention to it. So I would, uh, I think particularly well, most of my runs, if it's a whatever kind of, if it's a hard run, then I will have i do have like a protein shake i have now had or got have the sis recovery stuff as well which i've been been sent to test out and that's been really good and actually that's something i'm probably gonna choose to use over the next few months as well too um and then i just lean i look to my tech basically i mean i get the boots out i get the recovery boots out i get the massage <laughs> gun out all those things i've got like cup of, you know like cupping things as well so I do, I do think it makes difference for me and it's just you know it's something that i have neglected and with the, the usual things we should be doing after runs and you know, taking a bit better care. But it is something that I have always kind of, I've started to kind of build into my training and it does is something I pay more attention to, I would say. So not like you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, McDonald's are a pasty for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, calories are a big thing. I mean, the other thing I do is weigh myself a lot in marathon training to make sure I'm not losing weight um, because – yeah, it's not it's not ideal if you start doing that. But I don't do much of the other recovery stuff. I do. I have got my my Eckhart Yoga for Runners YouTube video, just, you know, video on YouTube I found five years ago, and I think I must have done it well over a thousand times since because <laughs> I've been doing it like two or three times a week. Uh, it's just like twenty minutes. It's good for runners because it's not too much. That's sitting down, which I can't do. I can't do sitting down yoga. I'm too tight. So it's um, yeah, good video that really good. <laughs> All right, so we talked a bit there about uh, fueling and recovery, but when it comes to uh, training and recovery with tech, do you actually use it? Is there anything you find useful or do you not use it? Mike? I I mean, I did mention a little bit, but yeah, I do. I mean, whether it is, I mean, this is always the thing with these things, whether it actually is doing anything. But for me, I have kind of leaned on using stuff. I do use the kind of Theragun recovery boots i mean they're great i sit up on the you know on my sofa lie on my sofa watch tv put them on i feel like they're doing something i feel like they're doing something so um and the massage gun i think i use i, well, I mean I actually use it for kind of warm up but also um kind of afterwards as well so i wouldn't use i mean i wouldn't use everything all at once i mean like you know in a good one go but i think like using some of it sometimes i think is i mean it has helped me i do think it has made a difference for me and it's it feels like i'm doing something extra on top of doing the things that you would expect to do in terms of your mm. you know when you, you, you cu- you're kind of battered from a, a run and you kind of need to rebuild that system so i do um whether it does make a huge amount of difference i don't know but I've, i like to feel that particularly something like the boots do kind of work <laughs> quite nicely and just easy to throw on as well so and you don't use anything do you nick I don't use anything like that. Uh, I I've got loads of watches and rings on at the moment, and using an app called HRV Training, and that's more actually for testing them because I, I tend to go quite a lot on feel on that kind of stuff, obviously. And if I'm run down, I know I'm run down. But it's good to test if the apps and the watches know I'm run down, or I use it a bit as a confirmation bias. But I use a you know I have a Garmin all the time, so the training readiness I think is just interesting for me to see. I I wouldn't base what I do training wise on that, but. I like to, you know, it's, it's interesting if it does fluctuate in the way I expect it to. Yeah. And then uh, the Aura Ring, I think it's still quite a useful hand. For, it, it's very good at spotting like little bits of illnesses, which I do crop up from time to time. So uh, over the weekend, I actually had something like that. And um, that's quite interesting to know, to limit intensity, that kind of thing. The HRV training app in the morning is quite interesting to see as well. Just again, it, all this stuff I think is trends you've got to look at, not actual what they say in terms of... Um, what they think you should do. I think that's never really the best way to go about it. But if you know a product really well, like I know Garmin's trading rate in the stat really well, having used it for a couple of years now. I know this HRV app reason why I used it before as well. So if I know the trends it's showing, uh, I, I, you know, I can tell how that really actually equates to what I'm, um, how I'm feeling and all going to be likely to perform on the run. I could tell yesterday before my workout, I was 
probably a little bit off in terms of where I might expect to hit pace wise and stuff like that. And it gives you a little bit of reassurance, I think, if you go into a workout with that attitude, knowing that there might be reasons you're not going to smash it out the park every single time. So I like all that kind of stuff, but mostly I'm testing it rather than it helping me, I think, uh, because I do think it's interesting to test those things during really heavy marathon training when they should be at their most useful, but also can come a cropper and just get things wrong quite a lot. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I, I've, I've got used Garmin and everything. I'll get the um, information back. Well, I think I don't really find it that useful most of the time. I think 95% of the time I know if I'm tired yeah. or if I overtrained. And if you're training for a marathon and you're doing mileage and you've got specific structured training in, you probably will know because you know how much you no- you normally do, you know how much you've increased it by, you know if the session is harder and all those sorts of things. Um, so, But I do find it useful sometimes as sort of check so just to see um just to see what it says because uh like you say sometimes you'll you'll do a run and um you may feel okay at the start but you you might not notice that you know you you should technically be have quite a low body battery um (laughs) so when you when you look at the when you look at the watch so i do find it interesting from that perspective i think it's probably useful more useful people who don't have a structured training or don't really follow a plan so you might one week you might do 50k next week you might do nothing um, and that gives you a bit of a, a, a better view on what your training really looks like in terms of your body battery. But yeah, I don't tend to, it doesn't shape my training basically. No, it wouldn't obviously because I've got a coach, but I, I, yeah, it's nice to have a little bit Like I think the training load stats are actually quite good on watches because that's quite a simple, you know, you know, they just look at in rough intensity and I wear a chest strap. So it's getting a decent heart rate reading in and yeah. intensity and load. And you, you know, just to look at that graph proceeding correctly and the you know garmin thinking i'm fit enough to suddenly raise this mileage and yeah. not suddenly but raise my mileage and do more hard workouts you know it's not a problem it's not like it's saying no you're 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 not you can't do this every single day it's just you know it's, it's about yeah. you know, suggesting i am ready for it all the time and well or bouncing back in time for another hard workout two days later which is you know what and, you and want if to you've see had a hard day and you've trained hard yeah. you want it to be low don't you you don't look at it and go oh yeah well, exactly what? yeah 75 percent. what's the so yeah so what when i went and did my brother's 40th pub crawl the weekend my training was obliterated and i was an absolute mess um because i did it straight after a 20 miler but um the watch every wearable picked up on that that's not surprising that's quite easy i, I, mean, I was yeah. not in a good way when i got home mike do you use them yeah, I think I, probably similar to to Nick. I think it's it's more a guidance. I think I think the training readiness is probably one of the most more of interesting things that I think has been added in terms of the wearable space. And I think it just gives you a very simple kind of you know reassurance in terms of well, maybe you are you know you do feel good and it, it, the data that it's and the sensors that it's getting that information for feel reliable enough for me to say well actually this is telling me something that is going to be useful. I think that's one that I've mainly paid attention to. I wear the Aura as well too. And I think, you know, sleep tracking, which a lot of these devices are pushing a lot more in sleep tracking. I think how much do I use that information? Probably not a huge amount. It's generally on my kind of finger to kind of compare against other devices that I'm testing. But I think the Garmin is generally on my on my wrist. I think um, Polar as well. I'm testing it. I've got the Polar back on and I think the sleep tracking is very strong on that watch as well. And I think there's there's things you can take from kind of polar's approach which i think can be really useful in terms of informing what you should do but ultimately it shouldn't be telling you exactly what you should do it's kind of giving you a bit of a kind of a a rough kind of feeling about what may be you know some guidance there so i think the the training readiness is a good example of where devices like uh, garmin's and other watches need to go in terms of delivering that kind of information and actually being information that you can kind of take on board Okay, let's dive into the big question then, shoes. <laughs> um, so we're going to do a video soon. Nick, you're going to do this video soon, not your marathon shoes, marathon <laughs> rotations. Yeah, we did the best marathon shoes a couple of years ago, which has a lot of sections, shoes for different kinds of people, different kinds of approaches in terms of racing and training, uh, and we'll have that video coming up soon. But I suppose here I would probably talk more about what you kind of rotation you need in marathon mm-hmm. training which might be different to your rotation outside of marathon training would be for me definitely like because yeah everything just gets a bit longer doesn't it yeah and i i find as well that people's marathon training shoes uh, marathon training rotation those that do have a rotation can vary can vary different from what you'd normally wear like you say yeah. um i've got shoes that i've been pulling out recently for runs that that i've not used them for for quite a long time because mm. i'm doing marathons since september 
Um, so, right, okay, um, Mike, what what types of shoes would you have in your rotation for the type of training that you do? So, I think the main ones for me. So, I definitely have something that's pretty cushioned that I would use for those kind of long runs, which are you know, there's not a bigger emphasis on me running close to my kind of race pace or more up tempo race or something nicely cushioned that's going to be comfortable that is going to feel comfortable from, you know, start to finish. That is a shoe that I will use and I will have in my rotation. I definitely like having a kind of up-tempo style daily trainer, one that if I need to mix up the paces in a run or it's a run where I particularly want to go a little bit quicker in, and that is a shoe that I would have. And then I will have the shoe that I'm probably looking to race in, and I will use that for kind of my longer runs at the kind of marathon pace. I would save it just for those runs. That's kind of how I would treat it to give me a good sense of how I'm going to feel on those longer runs at the pace that I'm aiming for and how it's going to feel to run in the shoes. So those kind of, I think that's probably, it's probably the three shoes that I probably kind of rotate between in, for my marathon training and they will probably serve me best for the types of runs I'm going to be doing. Go on then, Nick. Uh, so I pretty quite polarised. You know, I, when I do easy runs, they, I think they're very easy at this point. So would that just be a cushioned cruiser? You know, nothing, nothing stable. I'll probably aim for one that's quite stable as well. <laughs> the idea will give me a bit more support as well. But then the work I do. So I'll probably what I like to have is it's either a super trainer, like it's going to be something like the endorphin speed, that kind of thing, the Boston, or the equivalent without a plate, which means something like the Rebel or the Mac. You know, fast shoes uh, that will do. Easy to steady runs, uh, steady runs like like the hour I have coming up on Friday, which will be you know, decent pace the whole way. I mean, my first run in the endorphin speed, that's the kind of shoe that excels at that kind of run, just holding a decent pace over time, get a bit of help from the uh, plate or just a lightweight shoe like the Rebel. And then actually for long, hard workouts, like I probably would use carbon shoe and things get a bit, you know, get quite expensive in my marathon shoe rotation is probably the way to put it. You know, I would, I'd be using a race day shoe quite a lot with an eye on, you know, maybe splashing the cash on a newer version, uh, a new one for races itself. But um, yeah, I think the workouts start hitting really hard. It would be either the best super trainer. Like the speed is one that can do those workouts or always has been able to do the endorphin speed. So maybe that would cover it off some of them, as many as possible to save the race day shoe. But I'd probably use it reasonably regularly, actually, in a really hard week, just because, you know, those workouts are hard. There's lots more mileage to come and they protect the legs quite well. But yeah, when I can, it will be a, a yeah, like a, a nylon plate or no plate at all, uh, just to uh, you know, give you a bit more feel of where you are in terms of fitness, and also just take a plate out of the equation. Just, there's all those slight things in the back of the mind. You should be using a plate at you too much, but it's not negatively affecting me so far. How about mm. you, Tom? What do you got in your rotation? Uh, so at the moment, when I did Chicago, I was quite strict in that I had a really comfortable, basically the more V three at the time, like really comfortable, easy day shoe, which I was just doing my little easy runs and then i was using a hot Mac 5 for all of the training runs where i was running faster and then either uh well it would always be an older calm plate shoe basically or one i was testing for yeah. for the hard sessions because when i'm doing a hard session and i've got to maintain the pace like marathon pace or something like that i do find it quite hard so i basically want all the help i can get <laughs> on those runs yeah because uh, I, I don't want to enjoy it as much as possible but recently for so the training I'm doing now, I'm doing a similar thing to what you're doing. So I'm really only using an easy day shoe because most half of my runs are easy day uh, runs. And then the three other runs are actually quite hard because I, I, I don't really do a long run that doesn't have a harder bit in it, basically. Yeah. So I need help on those. So I'm basically <laughs> using uh, yeah old super shoes. So I'm pulling out the Saucony Pro 3s, things like that, older Alpha Flies and stuff for those runs just because – when you when you've got to maintain a specific pace, I'm going to do anything I can to make that as enjoyable as possible. Um, <laughs> especially when you're doing it for like 18 miles or something. So um, yeah, uh, at the moment it's basically an easy day shoe and then super shoes. Yeah, we're all, we're all gone soft basically. We're falling falling into the loving embrace <laughs> of our super shoes when we can, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. who knows where we'd be without them. But uh, it does make you feel very smug when you do do a decent long run like I did in the Rebel, and you go, "I didn't use a plate today. I'm, I'm amazing. I feel so smug." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't really happen very much with me. I think I did one a while. I think I, I used I think I used the Super Blast a little bit for Berlin for yeah. some of the tempo. Obviously, runs. we're very fortunate we get sent a lot of shoes, but I think now quite a lot of runners of our kind of position do have those older race day shoes that become mm. workout shoes, and then you, yeah, you know, you have a newer one for the race itself, uh, which is crazy. You know, it's big money, but um, yeah. it's yeah, <laughs> it's a still fairly cheap sport all around, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that'll uh, I think I'll do is for marathon 
kit chat. Do you want to uh, talk about my UFOS slippers? No, <laughs> no, well, nobody asked about that. You, have you got some UFOS slippers, Nick? <laughs> These are these are a big help to recovery. I do love these. They've, they've barely left my feet of late. Are you going to be talking about them in uh, the monthly? I'll whack them in a monthly uh, in a monthly Good. roundup. Can, They're um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Don't have to talk about them now. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I saw Tom's reaction to them. All right then, guys. Better get back to training. Yeah. Catch you later. Okay, that's it from us. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, click that little bell. And if you go into Catch and Blow, you can find a link to our podcast, which comes out at the end of each month. But also we've launched our special edition podcast, which is called Points of Shoe, where we answer your questions uh, that you've sent through about running shoes and tech and things like that. Um, so if you're interested in finding out what we said about the various questions that people sent through, give the podcast a listen and find out how you can submit your own questions. Thanks a lot for watching. Catch you next time.